not everything in the universe can be explained. Water is needed for life to exist on this earth. And the, and the earth is situated in just the right place in our solar system so that if it was a little bit closer to the sun, all the water would evaporate. And if it was just a little bit farther away from the sun, all the water would freeze. So we don't know quite how, but we know the earth is in just the right place for you and I to be able to live on it. Some 10 to 15 years after a female sea turtle is born, it returns to the area of its birth to lay the next generation of eggs. Now, how, how do these sea turtles know how to do this? How, how do they know to return right back off into the same beach where they were born to lay the next generation of eggs? We don't know how this happens, but we just observe it with amazement. There's a four-ounce bird called the Arctic tern. The Arctic tern migrates every year from Greenland to Antarctica. Greenland to Antarctica every year, 11,660 miles. How does this little four-ounce bird find Antarctica? Or find Greenland? How, how does this bird do this? We don't know, but we just watch it in amazement. So, can a fish swallow a man? Was Jonah really swallowed by a fish? There's two thoughts about this. The first one is, look, anyone who really believes that this literally took place, that a fish actually swallowed a man, is crazy. This story, so some people think, is just an allegory. A nice story that tells us some good principles, but it didn't really, really happen. Now, that's okay to believe that. And those who believe that, though, if you take that to the logical conclusion, then it means that there's no such thing as miracles. And it means that the universe is a closed system. And anything that cannot be measured scientifically just must not exist. That's the logical conclusion of those that believe that a fish can't swallow a man, even if the Bible says it. The other option, though, is that this story in the book of Jonah is historically accurate. Because if we believe that, then it leaves room for the unexplainable, doesn't it? And we can see that it could happen. Now, in archaeology, I'm told that when people uh, dig up uh, pottery or bones of people or something, they try to figure out how old things are by what's around them. And so if they dig up bones and they can figure out how old those bones are, they can see what pottery is around there and they figure out it's about the same age. And in our story of Jonah today, we can do the same thing literally or, or, or um, historically because if we find certain things in the book of Jonah that are historically accurate, then probably everything in the book of Jonah is probably historically accurate. So Nineveh. Chapter 1, Nineveh, as we learned last week, is an actual place. There's ruins from the city of Nineveh today that people can visit. And Nineveh is located right in the place where Mosul, Iraq is today. So you go to Mosul, Iraq, you will see the ruins of the actual city of Nineveh. Tarshish was a historical place on, in, in Spain, down near the Rock of Gibraltar, and it was known as a vacationing spot, a historical, actual place. Joppa is a real place. You can go to Joppa today. Some of you have been to Joppa today. It was a, it was a port town, and it's still known as a port in, in that city. Joppa is a real place. So, so far, when we see that these places are actual places, it's not an illogical jump to feel that this story is a true story. Now, if, let's say, just for the sake of argument, if someone added this story of the fish, added the fish thing, let's make the story of Jonah more interesting, let's add a fish in there to make it more exciting, wouldn't you think that the fish would have played a larger role? I mean, it's just a fish. I mean, there's only four places in the book of Jonah where it talks about this fish. 
chapter 1, verse 17, the Lord provided a fish. And that same verse says, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days. Chapter 2, verse 1, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed. And chapter 2, verse 10, the Lord commanded the fish, and it, there's a Bible word now, it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Four places the word fish is in the story. Into the fish. The fish did its job. It fulfilled the God-ordained role that it had and returned back to the deep. It's kind of like, kind of like the boat in chapter 1, isn't it? Job, uh, Jonah left for, for Tarshish, and he got caught in a storm, we remember. And the storm kind of corrected Jonah, put him on the right path, well, in the fish. And, and the, the boat resumed its journey once Jonah left it. So into the boat part, well, chapter 1 is the boat part, and chapter 2 is the fish part. So let's not get hung up on the fish, okay? The fish is part of the story, but it's not about the fish, is it? Chapter 2, verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Jonah assumed probably that when he was thrown into water, he'd drown. And the fish actually saved him. Now, last week we talked about the fact that in storms, in boats, uh, cargo is very important. Cargo are the things that people carry with them on the boats. And, and cargo was important to that boat, but when the storm hit, all of a sudden the value of that cargo changed, didn't it? And the cargo became a detriment. And the fishermen threw these, the sailors threw this cargo overboard because it was making the boat sink. In storms, some things that are valuable all of a sudden lose their value, don't they? In our personal storms, the things that we think are so important all of a sudden aren't quite as important to us anymore. And things that may not have been important in the past, when we face crises in our lives, those things become very important. Well, something very important to Jonah was his power to choose. His ability to choose his fate. He chose to disobey God. He chose to run in the opposite direction. He chose to hop aboard a ship heading to the far reaches of the known world, to Tarshish. But now, he's in the fish, and Jonah is out of options. No more choice. He's stuck precariously between life and death in the belly of this fish. He wasn't dead, but there wasn't much of a life down there either. And he was stuck between the ribs of this fish. And, and Jonah had nothing at all left to rely upon, did he? Nothing or no one but God. So Jonah prayed. Now, there are different kinds of prayers. Um, there's prayers of thanksgiving and prayers before meals and prayers at public events. And oftentimes, those prayers are eloquent. We, we sometimes write them down. We sometimes prepare for them when we pray publicly. And so those prayers have a place, prayers of thanksgiving. And there's sometimes prayers of praise, which are often very eloquent, and, and we rehearse them perhaps, and we praise the Lord out of our hearts, and those can be very eloquent and very heartfelt. Let me illustrate the third kind of prayer, though. Two years ago, when Hurricane Irma hit, my Major Pam and I were stationed in Orlando. And so she uh, took our dog and some friends of ours up, up to Alabama, and I stayed to hold down the fort at the core there in Orlando. The safest place in that core building was a room right off of the gymnasium. It was, it was brick on all sides, and I thought, this is the safe place to be. And so I, was, I put my, my sleeping bag down there, and I was the only one in the building, and Irma came and hit, and you, many of you remember that. Well, Irma came, and I was in the gymnasium. I put something in the microwave for dinner. I was walking across the gym floor, and I heard a loud boom and a crash. I looked up and not 20 feet from me, the ceiling of the gym started to cave in. Water started pouring in in front of me. Pieces of the ceiling and the roof were falling onto the gym floor. And, and pieces of wood were falling on. This is a picture of the tree when it hit. And I was under that tree watching the roof disintegrate in front of me. Now, I must admit to you, I didn't fold my hands. I didn't bow my head. I didn't close my eyes and say, dear Lord, I'm in a bit of a pickle here. 
Lord, I don't know if this roof is being pulled off by a tornado. I don't know if this roof is caving in because of the storm. Please provide guidance for me as I can best remedy this situation. I'm afraid I didn't say that. My prayer was two words, and it was very sincere. My prayer was, oh, God. <laughs> and, and that's the truth. And I got out of there as quick as I could. So the third kind of prayer, you've got prayers of praise, prayers of thanksgiving, and you've got prayers, which are very genuine, prayers of help. And mine, quite frankly, was a prayer of help. And I thank the Lord it wasn't any worse than that. Listen to the prayer of Jonah now, chapter 2. In my distress, he's, he's in a fish. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. I would expect Jonah to pray a help me prayer. But Jonah's prayer is a prayer of deliverance, isn't it? There's some thanksgiving in there. And there's some deliverance he prayed. His, and, but his prayer was not, not original. He didn't make those words up because his different parts of his prayer came from different psalms. The part about waves and breakers came from Psalm 18. We heard that this morning. The uh, I'm sure, distress from Psalm 18. Waves and breakers came from Psalm 42. The holy temple reference came from Psalm 5. Engulfing waters threatening him came from Psalm 69. My life is ebbing away came from Psalm 142. Salvation comes from the Lord came from Psalm 3. It seems that Jonah finally got a glimpse of God's mercy here. Don't you see? And we assume, and I assumed as well, that, that Jonah's greatest need was to be rescued from the fish. But actually, Jonah's greatest need was to be rescued from himself, wasn't it? This story is not so much about obedience and disobedience as it is about the grace of God. Peter Craig noticed that Jonah went down to Joppa. Then he went down into the boat and then down to the bottom of the boat and he was thrown overboard and sank down in the depths of the sea. And, and he says, not until Jonah was all the way down, finally stripped of his own buoyant self-sufficiency, was deliverance possible for him. Chuck Swindoll paints a picture of what it might have been like inside that fish. Close your eyes and imagine this. Pitch black. Sloshing gastric juices wash over you, burning skin, eyes, throat, and nostrils. Oxygen is scarce, and each frantic gulp of air is saturated with salt water. Everything you touch has the slimy feel of the mucous membrane that lines the stomach. Who's, who's in for lunch afterwards, huh? You feel claustrophobic with every turn and dive of the great fish. You slip and slide in the cesspool of digestive fluid. There are no footholds, no blankets to keep you warm from the cold, clammy depths of the sea. Don't you know that Jonah had hit rock bottom? For some of us, it's only when we reach our rock bottom bottom, when everything falls apart, when all the resources are exhausted, when we are finally able to open up and fully depend upon God. 
Some of you have been there. I'm told that when, when trying to overcome any kind of addiction, that you have to reach the bottom first before you can work your way up. But, but just being at the bottom of ourselves isn't enough. Jonah prayed when he was at the bottom. And what did Jonah learn about God's grace when he was between the ribs and all that muck that we heard about a moment ago? What, what did he learn about God? He learned that there was not a single thing he could do to better his situation. He learned that he was totally, 100% dependent upon God. Not so different for us, is it? You and I are, have nothing, absolutely nothing we can do to save ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. We can't cleanse ourselves. And it's so easy, almost unconscious, I think, for us as humans to act like, you know, if we work hard enough, or, or if we try our best to be a good person, or, or if, we, if we try to repair our relationship with God, and even when we do that, we think maybe that we put God in a position, imagine that, put God in a position where we think that he can't say no to us because we're just good people. And, and sometimes we think that because we're so good, God owes us something for being so good. That's not the case. J.I. Packer puts it this way. He says, we deserve nothing but condemnation. We're utterly incapable of saving ourselves. And God has saved us despite our sin at infinite cost to himself. This is why I think that we, we usually get a full sense of God's grace, not when we're living on the mountaintop spiritually, but, but in the high point of our lives, but, but the grace and, and we learn about him, the grace of him oftentimes is when we're in the valleys of our lives, where we're facing struggles and challenges in our lives, at the bottom when there's no hope for us. Some of you have, have uh, been up to Pikes Peak out in Colorado. It's 14,100 feet high, 115 feet high. 14,000 feet is Pikes Peak. There's a picture of it there. Gorgeous mountain, it's great up there. And, Around, around 11,000 feet is the tree line. 11 to 12,000 feet, that's where trees stop growing. Let's do the other picture, if you would, Major, of, of the tree line, just the one right before that. Um, and the trees stop growing about 11,000 feet. And so what happens is above that, it's beautiful, but there's no trees. It's just rocks. And, and so the view is great. It's a mountaintop experience, but nothing grows up there. In our lives, in the mountaintop experiences, they're great. The view may be great. The experience may be great. But growth doesn't take, take place in our lives for the most time when we're at the mountaintop experience. Growth takes place when we're in the valleys. And in the valleys is where it's lush. In the valleys here where it's green. It's the valleys where the water goes. And growth in our spiritual lives often takes place when we are in the spiritual valleys at the bottom where God can show us his mercy. Jonah had no other hope. At the end of Jonah's prayer in chapter 2, we sense here that he finally gets it. He says in verse 9, he says, salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation belongs to God only. Nobody else, he says. If someone is saved, it's totally God's doing. It's not a matter of, of God saving us partly and then we do the rest. It doesn't happen that way. It, we cannot and do not save ourselves. And this, my brothers and sisters, is the gospel. This is the good news, that we can do nothing to save ourselves. It's all God's doing. In our country here in the States, um, it's a strength to not have to rely on other people, isn't it? Self-made people are considered people that are looked up as successes. And, and if we can fix ourselves, it's a good thing in our country, but those rules don't apply in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, it's the opposite, because strength is not in relying on ourselves. Strength is relying on God. And as Jonah found out, salvation is only found in him. It's impossible for us to fix ourselves. So this morning, if you find yourself in in the stomach of some dark, slippery, distasteful circumstance in your life, 
This is a place where God can touch you and his grace can speak to you. If that's the case, don't get in the way of God's grace in your life. Because total reliance upon him is a lifelong endeavor. And whether you've maybe never walked with him, maybe this is the first time you've heard this, or maybe you've walked with him for years or decades, today may be the day to lean on him, to lean into him and put your trust in him. Maybe for the first time today, maybe for the dozenth time, maybe the reminder today is, I'm going through a tough time, but Lord, I can trust you. I can lean on you, and I know there's nothing I can do to fix my situation, but you are the one who provides mercy for me. It's about trust, isn't it? It's about grace, and it's about trust. And we've sung about trust this morning. We're going to continue to sing as we sing our our chorus, a very simple chorus. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. That's all the words. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. And this morning, if, if you're maybe having a struggle putting your total trust in him, whether you've never met him before, whether you've walked with him for years, the reminder is is fit for today. And maybe he wants you to lean into him and further put your trust in him. And as we sing this chorus, then I would invite you to come down here and kneel. If you're praying for someone else that needs to put their trust in him, and we referred to today about grandchildren or grandparents that we want to pray the Lord to touch their lives. That may be a time to do that today. As we sing this chorus, respond as the Lord would have you to respond. If, you, if it's to come kneel, fine. If it's to pray where you're seated, fine. Let's just affirm our trust in him today and know that he provides his mercy. But sometimes we have to be in the valleys for us to sense that. Let's sing. <laughs> as Jonah did in his predicament situation, that salvation is only from the Lord. Thank you for the reminder this morning. There's nothing we can do. 
to save ourselves. It's all you. Guide us as we, as we lean into you, as we trust you this next week. For it's in your holy and your precious name we pray. Amen.